Um, hi everyone, thank you for having me along to your wonderful country. It's so lovely and warm out there. Um, I'm from the UK, so it is not as warm. Um, firstly, I want to apologize for the lurid pink slide. It is actually purple on my machine, um, but we're, we're gonna, we'll deal with it, it's fine. So I'm a front-end developer at a company called Clearleft in Brighton in the UK, um, and I'm also a guest writer for CSS Tricks. So um, there's going to be quite a lot of CSS tricks in this presentation. Um, but first, I'm going to start this talk at the beginning, a beginning that all of us have had to face at some point in our lives. How does this make you feel? A blank page. Is it an exciting canvas brimming with endless possibilities? Or are you more like me? Is it a little bit intimidating? Getting started on a project can be hard. Possibilities stretch out infinitely in front of you until your palms get a bit sweaty and your brain fills with static. And before you know it, you're alphabetizing your spice rack or endlessly scrolling through cat videos on Instagram. The first time that I felt the pressure of a blank page was when I was about four. Ever since I figured out how to hold a crayon, I loved to draw. I drew non-stop. But when I started school, I started to doubt myself. I was then more concerned with how good my drawings were and whether I was doing them properly. I started drawing a lot less. I'd stare at the blank page and I wouldn't know where to start. Luckily for me, my mum saw this and she started what we called the scribble game. My mum would do a scribble on the page, just a scribble, nothing fancy, but then she'd hand me the pen and say that I had to make it into something. And it worked. With just a little pen stroke, the fear of the blank page was gone. The scribble provided a limitation and a challenge, a place to start and something to achieve. Authors call the fear of the blank page writer's block, and Wikipedia defines it as a temporary or lasting failure to put words on paper. An artist and author called Austin Cleon overcomes this by taking words away instead of writing them down. He calls it blackout poetry. So rather than staring down a blank page waiting for inspiration, he starts with a newspaper. He then takes a marker and bit by bit, he blacks out words until a hidden story emerges. It's like poetry by subtraction. Another famous author, Ernest Hemingway, also used this technique of imposing constraints to break through his writer's block. In his book, A Movable Feast, he writes, sometimes when I was starting a new story and I couldn't get it going, I'd sit in front of the fire and squeeze the peel of the little oranges into the edge of the flame and watch the sputter of blue that they made. I'd think, don't worry, you've written before and you're right now. All you have to do is write one true sentence, write the truest sentence that you know. So some of these short stories eventually grew and evolved into novels, but Hemingway also kept some of the sentences as they were. And one of these sentences became famed as the world's shortest story. In only six words, it manages to tell a whole heartbreaking tale. So this collection over the years has influenced numerous attempts to create a story within a tight character limit, and it's credited to the birth of a genre called flash fiction. And one of my favorite authors, Jeff Noon, he used to post these amazing flash fictions on Twitter. Uh, he called them microspores. But unfortunately, when they put the character limit up from 140 to 280, he stopped. Enough of a challenge. It's not just writers who suffer from writer's block, though. People from all walks of life face decision paralysis due to overthinking the available possibilities. 
Decision paralysis is the state of overanalyzing a situation so that a decision or action is never taken, in effect paralyzing the outcome. In a way, our brains are a bit like computers. The more data we have available, the harder it is for us to process it. I heard a great example of this the other day. It's also about space, and I love space, so that's great. Um, and before we managed to land men on the moon, there was a NASA project called Surveyor. And the purpose of Surveyor was to build a small unmanned machine that would land on the moon, take measurements and photos, and later deploy a roving vehicle. The problem with this project was that no one could agree on what the surface of the moon was actually like. Scientists had worked out three or four completely opposing theories. So some scientists thought that it was a layer of loose powder, some thought that the powder could potentially be deep enough to engulf the spacecraft completely. Other scientists thought that it would be jagged shards of rocks or crystals. And others thought that the surface itself could be flammable or even explosive. So given this ambiguity, obviously none of the engineers had any idea how to get started. It was an expensive project and they didn't get a second attempt. The engineers knew it needed to be per perfect the first time round. Months went by without any progress. Eventually, a woman named Phyllis Bewalder, pictured here, uh, known for her work on a model of the lunar surface, published an internal spec describing the surface as mostly flat, tough and grainy, with small stones and boulders. So with less possibilities to process and the fear of making the wrong decision removed, the engineers got to work. Later, one of Phyllis's colleagues mentioned that the surface that she predicted looked suspiciously similar to the terrain outside the NASA base in the southwestern desert. She replied with a knowing smile, yes, but the engineers can't work without a specification, and if it turns out to be much more complicated than that, we aren't going to be spending much time there anyway. The engineers went on to build a lunar landing pod that, although not designed perfectly for the terrain they encountered, was good enough. It landed. This is the Surveyor 3 spacecraft getting a visit from the Apollo 12 commander, Charles Conrad, in 1969. So the specif specification that Phyllis provided gave the engineers a constraint and gave them a way to get past the fear of creating an imperfect situation. Aiming for perfection can often be stifling. And unless you're making a life-altering decision, you don't need to demand perfection. Sometimes applying a constraint and picking a good enough option is the best decision. Perfect is the enemy of good. Now, I don't make life-altering decisions, write flash fiction, or play the scribble game with more. My creative outlet is coding, specifically web animation. I spend a lot of my time making things on CodePen. If you don't know CodePen, it's a place to write and share front-end code. It's like, um, like a playground for front-end web developers. You can create pens which allow you to showcase HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in one interface right in the browser. And you get a real-time preview, and you can save a showcase of your work. And you can use CodePen to learn new things by tinkering, or to try out new web technologies for the first time, or to browse through what other people have made and figure out how they've made it. So this here, this is my blank page. In a pen, you get three panels one for your HTML, one for your CSS, and one for your JavaScript. And when I initially started making things on CodePen, I decided to try and see what I could make without touching the JavaScript panel. So I made this demo with SVG filters, some SVG masking, and stacked CSS transforms for the animation. I'm not going to go into SVG filters right now because we don't have time, and I'll, I'll get a bit too into it. Um, but they're great. They work a bit like filters in Photoshop. There's um, a variety of filters that create different graphic effects. And then after you've applied a filter, you can use the result of that operation as input to another filter. So because of this, there's an infinite amount of cool effects at our disposal. 
I've put links to code pens whenever I'm not showing the code. So if you're interested, you can dig in deeper later on. Um, this particular GUI effect, it works by combining two filters. There's one that blurs the elements, and another that increases the alpha contrast uh, to redefine the edges. It's quite a cool trick. So it's really fun seeing how much you can achieve without reaching for JavaScript or an animation library. And there's a lot of incredibly impressive CSS-only work out there. I don't know if anyone's seen this one. Um, Diana Smith makes these spectacularly intricate CSS-only oil paintings. <laughs> um, so she has a few rules. All elements must be typed out by hand. Only text editor and Chrome dev tools are allowed. And SVG use is limited. Um, she only reaches for SVG when she gets really stuck. And all shapes can only use hand-plotted coordinates and Bezier curves without the aid of any graphics editor. So it's even more fun in Internet Explorer. <laughs> I quite like this one. It's like unintentional cubism. Uh, another mind-blowing series of work comes from Lynn Fisher. So Lynn creates these drawings with CSS that use only one single div in the HTML markup. During her time as a fine arts student, Lynn did uh, color mixing exercises, where she had to create her color palette by only using the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. And the purpose of the exercise was to learn the medium itself and understand the constraints. So later, when she reskilled as a web designer, Lynn decided to challenge herself to learn all she could about her new me medium by exploring and experimenting with its limits. So Lynn, with only a single div and browser-supported CSS properties, it may seem like the tools are too limited. But she found it's al not always what you have to work with, but how you look at it. So Nathan Taylor also looks at things quite differently. There's limited ways that you can track user interactions with CSS, and one of these ways being hover. So he's taken advantage of this simple selector to create this crazy platform game. <laughs> so this was the first time I'd ever seen a game made using CSS. And at the time, for work, I was making a falling objects game uh, for a recycling campaign. The game at work was made with JavaScript, taking advantage of an animation library called Greensock um, for the animation and hit detection. But I decided I wanted to try and remake it with CSS. Problem was that this game was a little bit more complex. We had to keep track of a score. But it turns out you can actually do that with CSS. So, this here is all the code you need to keep track of a score with CSS. So on the left here are our checkboxes, um, and on the right is where all the magic happens. And the first thing you need to do is instantiate a counter on a section with counter reset. I've put it on the body in this case. So CSS counters are like numeric variables. The variable values can be changed using counter increment. The value for counter increment and counter reset should be the same, but can be named anything. I've been super creative and just used game in this case. Um, and game is the variable that keeps track of our score. So as a lot of you will know, checkboxes have got a Boolean attribute of checked that can be altered without any JavaScript just by clicking on them. Um, and we can access this in our CSS by using the checked pseudo class. Whoa. Somewhere. <laughs> um, so we can use this alongside counter increment to change the value held in our game variable. So when we click on a good object, we're adding two. And when we click on a bad object, we're subtracting one. Um, because we can only access this value in CSS, um, it's a little tricky to display it, but we have pseudo elements and the content property. 
Uh, Styling-wise, checkboxes are by default little square boxes with a tick inside when they're activated. Um, but we can override the styling on the input to make it look like anything we want. And using the check pseudo class, we can also style the check state, in this case, to make the objects disappear when we click on them. So I've popped the code in a code pen and linked to it. So after this, if you want to, you can all go away and make a CSS-only game. No JavaScript. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's not just all colorful blobs and games, though. I do actually have a job. <laughs> So things I've learned making CSS-only things in CodePen uh, have helped me many times writing production code. When you restrict yourself to a limited tool set, you inevitably delve deeper into it. You get to learn its quirks and its lesser known features. And knowing the limitations of something you're working with makes you more able to make judgment calls on when you should reach for a different language or a different library or a different framework to solve a problem, rather than just bashing away at the problem like this chap. So I was recently working on this website for UX London. And we wanted to add subtle animation in with the background graphics as the user scrolled the page. And I avoided having to use JavaScript to hook into scroll events, which can be computationally expensive by making use of hover. Now, each of the big slabs across the website have a hover effect a hover state, sorry, which is triggering the CSS animations in the background. So it feels like the animations are being triggered by scroll, but with less of a performance hit. It's hard to see some of them on this screen, unfortunately. So this was self-imposed, but occasionally I've been in situations where using just CSS was a necessity. Just going to have a bit of water. So at my previous job, I made banner ads. You probably didn't see them, because we all have ad blockers nowadays. <laughs> job satisfaction. Um, so banner ads come with a few constraints already. There's always, always a size constraint, both in terms of dimensions and size in kilobytes, and a time constraint to work within. Most ad serving platforms now allow you to use Google CDN hosted animation libraries like Greensock. But when I was making these ads, Greensock wasn't on Google CDN yet, and AdWords didn't allow external JavaScript. We'd made this video animation, Smith's Uni, and they wanted to use it for all of their ad placements. We had a salesperson that told them that this was fine without checking with the dev team. So this was fine for the ad placements that they'd bought that supported video. But some of them were AdWords and didn't support video or allow JavaScript. Well, I rolled my sleeves up and I got stuck into some CSS. I got really stuck in, completely lost track of time, and ended up with about 5,000 lines of keyframes. I hadn't discovered SAS at this point, and I don't recommend that anyone try this at home. But I managed it. Again, I've linked to the code, so if you want to look through the 5,000 keyframes, you can. Don't do it. <laughs> um, so disclaimer, this is using ClipPath, which isn't supported in Internet Explorer, Edge, or Opera Mini. Um, but we served a backup image for them and went ahead with it. Uh, but it is experimental. Um, it's using transforms for the movement, though. So on browsers that do support ClipPath, the performance is actually pretty good. So in the HTML over here, I stacked a few images on top of each other. And then I used ClipPath to effectively cut out sections of the image and then transformed them horizontally from side to side to kind of create the glitch effect. 
Um, so the steps timing function is what's giving it the stilted feel. Steps is a type of ease. In all other places with animation, we call easing, easing. Um, but in CSS, we call an ease a timing function for some reason. I don't know why. They're just trying to confuse us. Um, but it is an ease. Uh, it specifies the number of steps between the first state and the end state of an animation. So because of this staggered effect, it's also quite good for making animated sprites. So I've slowed it down a little bit here so you can see what's going on. Just chopping out sections and moving them around. And then doing it really fast and for 5,000 lines of keyframes. Um, so the best thing about this project, other than feeling like a bit of a CSS wizard, was how involved I got and how much fun I had in the process. Completely lost myself, and I learned a lot of things about CSS animation in the process. And finding ways to make learning more fun is very important to me as I organize and coach at Codebar Brighton. So shameless shout out, I know we're a million miles from Brighton, but uh, Codebar is a free weekly nonprofit workshop offering programming help to people from groups that are underrepresented in the tech industry. And we often get feedback from students that learning how to code can be pretty overwhelming. I think especially if you're like me and this puppy and you get distracted really easily. There's just so many libraries and frameworks and ways to accomplish things. And when it comes time to actually sit down and learn something new, the amount of options can feel paralyzing. To a point, Codebar can help with this. When students first start attending, they work their way through tutorials. And the tutorials themselves provide structure and focus. But the problem comes when students move on from the structure of tutorials. Once they've learned enough, we encourage them to explore what they've learned by working on a personal project. And figuring out where to start with that is really hard. A lot of students struggle to get going, or get going and abandon projects halfway through. And now, I don't think that this is a problem that only our students face. How many people in here have started a project only, only to abandon it because it wasn't turning out perfect? Who here spends far too long planning a project and never actually gets started? If you said yes, you're not alone. So the tech industry is full of people just like you. Studies show that intelligent people, yes, I am calling you all intelligent, are more likely to show perfectionist tendencies. Research also says that those with higher IQs are more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety. So giving up or not starting on a project is definitely a surefire way to guarantee that you won't do it badly, so you won't do it at all. But being bad at something is a really important part of learning. You have to be bad at something sometimes for a very long time before you're good at it. And delaying the start of a project or endlessly planning doesn't help. Perfectionists often also use overthinking as a way to delay our actions in fear of making a wrong choice. So we find at Codebar that giving students a limitation can be really, really helpful. So if, like me and the Codebar students, you saw this blank page and thought it was mildly terrifying, maybe you would like some help getting started. I'm going to give you some jumping off points. I often start with suggesting a theme. Code pen challenges are really great for this. So you can subscribe on the website, and you get weekly challenges right into your inbox. In the time I've been doing code pen challenges, they've had all sorts of themes, from animals and shapes to more practical stuff like typesetting blog posts and recreating retro games like Pong. And my favorite was the Pac-Man challenge. But the lovely folks at CodePen don't just give you a theme. They also provide some ideas and recommend resources. 
And then when the challenge gets going, they collate all the pens so you can check out what other people are making and get inspired. Great. Um, so Codevember is also another good one, issue being that it's in November and we're quite a way away from November, so you might want to get started a bit sooner than that. Um, but the goal with Codevember is to build a creative bit of code every day in November. They give you a daily keyword, and they also collate the entries like CodePen challenges. I took part in Codevember last year, and it made me realize the importance of another very useful constraint. Time. So trying to create a bit of creative code every day is very hard. I was striving for perfection, and I eventually had to put a time limit on it to maintain my sanity. Without a time constraint, it's far too easy to spend an eternity thinking and planning and get nothing done. Equally importantly, give yourself time. Sometimes you can't tackle a problem. That's OK. Rather than procrastinating and feeling bad, allow yourself to take time out. Go and make a cup of tea, or come back to it later. The Pomodoro technique is great for time management. So it allows you time for focus, and it also allows you time to step away. It encourages you, encourages you to break your work down into 25-minute chunks separated by short breaks. And the way that the Pomodoro technique encourages you to break up your work is also very helpful. Shifting attention from one big decision to a set of smaller but easier to make ones can help you make progress while freeing you from the paralysis of trying to make a big and significant choice. Also remember, if you're going to set deadlines for yourself, make them realistic. You don't want to enforce a too tight deadline and that, as this can cause unnecessary stress and ultimately harm your productivity. Speaking of unnecessary stress, if you're someone who writes technical blog posts and you find it hard getting started, um, maybe check out this writing app. You choose how long you'd like to write for, say five minutes or half an hour, and then you write non-stop until the clock runs out. <laughs> if you pause for even five seconds, it will wipe everything that you just typed that doesn't save it. <laughs> it's not very useful if you're trying to get a blog post down, but if you're stuck and you just can't get any words on paper, it can really kickstart you. It does help. If you're learning to code, I mean, all of us are learning to code, aren't we? It's continuous. Um, playing with a specific library or API is a fun way to impose a constraint, too. So I made this pen during Codevember, prompted by that day's keyword of space. Yes, this is a theme. Uh, and it was one of my favorites. I used a library called Mo.js to make the space dust. Now, Mo.js is a great little animation library. It's in beta. It's always been in beta and it's not being worked on anymore. Um, the guy that started it actually works for Greensock now. Um, but it's still there, and it's amazing. And all of the options are beautiful out of the box. And you can do jazzy things like bursts and swirls with a couple of lines of code. It's really good fun to play around with. And like with flash fiction, character limits can also impose a fun constraint. In the programming world, we've called this code golfing. So the idea behind code golfing is to reduce code down to as few characters as possible while it remains functional. So in real golf, the fewer strokes to get the ball in the hole, the better you're doing. Similarly, in code golf, the fewer characters you use, the better you're doing. So if you want to give this a go and JavaScript's your language of choice, go and check out Twitter. Uh, see what you can create when limited to only 140 characters of JavaScript. It gives you a canvas as well, so what you create is quite visually appealing. And there's some really mind-blowing work on there. Now, if JavaScript isn't your thing, there's a great CSS option here at CSS Battle. 
you get a target image and you have to use your CSS skills to replicate the target with the smallest amount of code possible and one div, kind of like Lynn Fisher's work. And lastly, if you've enjoyed the web animation and creative CSS in this talk and you'd like some help getting started, I suggest joining the Pass the Pen community. Pass the Pen is a super fun way to make something creative within constraints. And there's a supportive Spectrum community on hand to help you get going. So Pass the Pen is a little bit like the web nerd version of a game that I used to play when I was younger. Um, I thought maybe you might have played it too. Uh, someone would draw a head on the top of a piece of paper and fold it and then pass it to the next person. And they'd draw a torso and fold it and pass it to the next person until you ended up with a whole collaborative person drawn on a piece of paper. So with Pass the Pen, a theme gets picked. Someone starts off some code in a code pen and then passes that along. So everyone gets a chance to add something. You can add whatever you want, but you're not allowed to change anyone else's contributions. This one was also space-themed. <laughs> uh, we ended up with a TARDIS, which is very cool. So anxiety related to imposter syndrome and perfectionism plague many people in the tech industry. But remember, you are your own worst critic. And getting something out is better than never starting. So next time that you're trying to kick off a project or make something fun or learn something new and you don't know where to start, just start with a scribble. Thank you. Also, my DMs are always open, so if you have any questions about animation or SVG or CSS, um, just, yeah, pop me a message. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cassie. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day in Athens. Okay, so um, how's everyone feeling? Feeling good? Fantastic. I think the next talk, uh, we have about eight minutes or so. Does anybody have any questions for, for Cassie? Oh, yeah. While we have... While we have her here, we have a few minutes. And yes, here we are. There's one here. Did you experience any challenges in having the same thing working on mobile? Pardon? Did you have any? Um, with what in particular? Well, I like what you did with CodePen and all the animations, but would that same thing work on a small mobile phone where you have? Limited resolution, would are that you, still work? Are you talking about the glitching animation? Yeah. That, that ad size, particularly, that was a 300 by 250 ad dimension, so that was being served on both mobile and desktop. It worked perfectly fine. Yeah. I think there's one Yes, there. one more here. You said you were doing animations with SVG, right? Pardon? And the, the, are you making SVG animations? Yes, SVG animation. Uh, do you think that JavaScript is just enough to make animations with SVG? Um, so when you're dealing with SVG animation, um, there's actually some issues with CSS and how CSS handles transforms for SVG DOM elements. Um, so as, as great as CSS animation is, it doesn't really transfer over and work with SVG. Um, so if you're looking at SVG animation, I'd recommend an uh, animation library called Greensock. It's wonderful. Um, all the documentation online is perfect. Um, and there's like a really good community behind it. Uh, and there's also lots of really cool plugins where you can like morph SVGs and redraw SVG shape paths and all. So you're using only CSS and other libraries? Java, do, you, do you use JavaScript? Yes, that's what Greensock is. Greensock is a JavaScript animation library. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cassie, thank you so much.